Hey, greetings, everyone. It is GleeCon, and I am here with you once again for another episode of Lore of Warcraft. On our last episode, we started our final kind of segment through the Red Ridge Mountains in World of Warcraft Classic. We've been playing through that, um, and I have a trio of people going through that zone, so we did our first kind of third where you saw... I finished the zone with Erator, our human paladin, and he started it. It was actually really fun. Uh, so far, I've done it twice over the past couple weeks. Um, I did it once with my warlock on some gnomes with Lady Gleekon, and um, I, we had a fun time doing the elite quest. You have to group up, really, for them. So I did some of the solo stuff on camera, uh, and then right away off camera, I, I found a small group, and... It was pretty clutch. Erator has definitely evolved into one of the better characters, uh, Pallies, for the win, at least in this phase when, when my gear is a little bit above average. Um, we've also been reading the final Dungeons & Dragons sourcebook material as our aside. This one's called Dark Factions. We are getting nearer, nearer and nearer to the end of that journey and also to the end of the book. We're in the seventh chapter out of ten. It is all about the various factions. Last time we, we read about the Darkmoon Fair... Kind of interesting little aside uh i would really recommend if you liked it to go back to the episode where we read the manga that was a pretty cool one too i think it's called uh how to make friends or something like that um but stay a while and listen we're going to jump into the deafiest brotherhood of a very cool faction in the world of warcraft classic and actually beyond um up into cataclysm for sure so they're huge Anyone that's been in Westfall and Elwyn and beyond and has had to kill countless of them for those red bandanas knows there is essentially an endless amount. And in Warcraft terms, they're saying that that is 18,000. They're lawful evil, and I think they just stick that lawful designation. Anytime you have a very strictly hierarchical um, enemy group that, that uh, kind of follows the chain of command and reports to a specific leader without a lot of infighting, they, they tag that as lawful evil. The agents of the Defius Brotherhood are active throughout the kingdom of Stormwind, terrorizing small hamlets and townships in the Elwyn Forest, bullying farms in Westfall and Duskwood, which that will be where Erator goes next, and infiltrating the noble houses of Stormwind. The Brotherhood's central base of operations, however, is found in the deadbinds of Westfall and the outlying town of Moonbrook. Beyond Westfall and Elwyn, its influence is diminished. They are allied with gnolls, kobolds, and a few goblins in Booty Bay, but orcs and trolls consider them to be just another annoying human faction and are as likely to attack them as any human, which limits their influence in Lakeshire and Stranglethorn Vale, mostly because Lakeshire is dominated by orcs in addition to gnolls and Stranglethorn Vale. I'm guessing trolls? We haven't explored that very much. The Defius Brotherhood performs highway robberies and constructs harvest golems to terrorize farmsteads while engaging in labyrinthine plots to undermine Stormwind's leadership. I think we read a little bit of lore about why they use those harvest golems. The Defius Brotherhood, while founded with benign intentions, degenerated into a well-organized pack of bandits and thugs. For the kingdom of Stormwind, the Defius Brotherhood poses an immediate threat. It is an implacable enemy whose hatred of the city knows no limits. And there's a lot of lore that taps into the reasons why that is. Maybe we're going to get into it right now as we talk about their history. The Defius Brotherhood is the creation of one of the greatest human engineers in history, Edwin Van Cleef. After the Alliance recaptured Stormwind at the end of the Second War, King Tyrannus of Lordaeron was determined to help rebuild his ally's city. He convinced the Alliance to send money and laborers to Stormwind City to effect the repairs. The group in charge was the Stonemasons Guild, headed by Master Builder Edwin Van Cleef. The guild reconstructed Stormwind as a city of splendor, one that eclipsed memories of the old city. The city, which should have taken a generation to rebuild, was completed in less than 10 years. Even his most grudging enemies had to bow to the man's talents as an architect and engineer. After the guild finished the job, though, the corrupt House of Nobles refused to pay the guild for its work. King Varian was unable to fix matters because the House of Nobles held too much political power and outmaneuvered him repeatedly. Some of the more senior of the stonemasons, including Van Cleef, were offered governmental jobs if they'd just be quiet and play along. However, Edmund Van Cleef was not willing to betray his workmen. He spat on the floor and walked out of the halls he'd built, vowing that he'd make the city pay one way or another. 
Shortly afterward, at Van Cleef's urging, workers rioted in Stormwood City. Several people died in Van Cleef, and many other members of the Stonemasons Guild left the city for good. Now, you could argue that the corruption, or or you could maybe connect some dots, I guess, or some red, some red string, that the House of Nobles was corrupt because Deathwing and his children were already influencing politics in um, in the region. And it has also been portrayed in other lore that we've read as simply a defaulting on payment because priorities shifted and, and the company's coffers were overwhelmed after the, after the results of one, two, three massive Central Elite World Wars. Several years after the riot, the outlaw gangs of the Defius Brotherhood first appeared in Westfall. They attempted to foment rebellion among the farmers and merchant folk, but when the war-weary people told them that they wished to be left in peace, Van Cleef turned to more ruthless tactics. Merchants who brought goods to Stormwind were robbed. Farmsteads that provided Stormwind with food were raised or infested with harvest golems. Eventually, no tax collector could safely ride through the streets of Elwyn Forest, even with a large escort. As Van Cleef strangled Stormwind stone by stone, he used the money he stole to pay for bands of mercenaries. Some of his men were captured, but Van Cleef played even that to his advantage. Inside the stockade of Stormwind City, his men gathered a force for rebellion. We have yet to do that, although it is on the horizon. Stormwind and its loyal townships found themselves under an unexpected siege. And thanks to sinister machinations of others, the town's cries for help went unheard, those machinations being, I believe, the Black Dragonflight. Buoyed by his success, Van Cleef christened his gang of outlaws, rebels, and brigands the Defius Brotherhood. Why? These lowlifes still see themselves as the wrong party fighting a battle against arrogant nobles and the fools who unquestioningly follow them. I suppose they have a point. In Stormwind City, however, people tell different tales of citizens being driven from their homes, of children murdered, and many other atrocities committed by a band of thugs who are motivated solely by the joy of terror. At what point do atrocities cancel a just grievance? Valid question. Philosophical question. Um, valid, absolutely, especially in the context of the game's lore. Van Cleef's most ambitious plan involves the reconstruction of a huge war machine, an ogre juggernaut from the first war, and that's where you fight kind of the final battle in his sort of Goonies-like cave. He has hired goblins to repair the ship as it was their race that constructed the ships originally. Okay, makes sense. Van Cleef plans to use the ship to disrupt trade with Stormwind, thus depriving Stormwind of the riches that the city wrongfully withheld from the Stonemasons Guild. Van Cleef wants to turn the ship into a pirate ship. Wisely, Van Cleef does not rely on a single plan, but he likes the justice of building machines to destroy a city he constructed. It's not inconceivable that Van Cleef and his goblin favorites have devised other weapons of war, weapons that might survive his death and trouble the world for ages to come. And they absolutely do. Just look at Cataclysm and the storyline that comes out of that. We will read about that. If you don't know and you're not aware already from having done the, the dungeon and I think the heroic version, which came out in Mists of Pandaria, maybe. Uh, then I won't tip I won't tip my hat about that yet. And it looks like we have a Defius right there, uh, having murdered probably one of my characters. That looks like Callie. I'm sure I've died to them a thousand times. And there's some of those bandanas that you try to steal. <clears throat> the Defius Brotherhood is a solitary organization. Its only allies are the Knolls of Elwind and the Kobolds of Westfall, both of whom are old enemies of the local humans who were cast aside when the Horde was driven out of Stormwind during the Second War. Both sides know they are allies of convenience. Mercenary companies, many of whom are veterans of the Second War or their displaced sons, who did not reap the benefits of the war's end, are especially sympathetic to the Defius Brotherhood, particularly while the Brotherhood's coffers maintain a ready supply of gold and silver. To the Alliance, however, the Defius Brotherhood poses a grave threat, one of many in these times, in Stormwind City, many knights who were raised to battle the Horde are now being told to save a few sword strokes for the Defius, and Alliance military leaders short on skilled men hire adventurers to fight their fellow humans in the Brotherhood. That's where we come in. Van Cleef is the unquestioned leader of the Defius Brotherhood. Beneath him is the inner circle derived from Stormwind's old network of stonemasons and artisans. They have no titles except for the titles of their professions, apprentice, journeyman, artisan, mason, master mason, and so forth. The word brotherhood is not used trivially. Members of the Defius Brotherhood see themselves as members of a secret society who have a responsibility to take care of each other. In particular, the inner circle regards other members as an extended family and has a strong sense of commitment and community support, if only they offered such noble sentiments to their victims. 
The craftsmen, particularly those who also have military experience, serve as commanders for the bands of mercenaries and bandits that make up the bulk of the Brotherhood. Based in Moonbrook, they use an elaborate network, network of messengers to communicate with their bands or leave messages at prearranged points. Young members backed by mercenaries or friendly bandits run outposts. Treachery is rare among their ranks, but their increasingly dark deeds move some of the Brotherhood's more idealistic members to turn on the group. They have no ranks, though capable fighters are given command positions and called captains. The Brotherhood's only uniform is a red bandana worn to hide faces, and that's enough to identify them in the Kingdom of Stormwind. The principal base of the Defius Brotherhood is in the Deadbinds, which are located under the mountains between Stranglethorn Vale and Westfall, which can be accessed through a hidden barn entrance in the town of Moonbrook, which is also a Defius stronghold. The dead mines are a vast network of mines rich in copper, tin, and silver, but they're also home to an uncomfortably large number of undead whom the Defius avoid in that one, gosh, how many times have I had to sit there and just farm those undead for those miners' badges. Deep within the dead mines are several portals, which eventually lead to Van Cleef's base of operations. Interesting, because I don't remember seeing any of those. But there are a lot of mages. Beyond the dead mines, the Defius Brotherhood has control of the farms in Westfall and Elwyn Forest, and if you didn't catch my episode where I talked about it, I strongly recommend farming um, the Defius in Elwyn Forest. There is a drop quest that can come, which is probably one of the most lore-rich in-game items you can get that addresses this lore. Uh, let's take a little sidebar story. Knowles, Artemal grumbled. I don't know why we have to put up with that lot. Patrick nodded, gazing at the hyena-faced nomads who were passing by their post. The Defius Brotherhood was shifting its position in the hills, an arduous process that involved scouring the territory for spies and shooting them before permitting their null allies to move. It made for a long day. Patrick groaned. I'm tired. Those dog faces look like they're starving. And guess what would be on the menu if they decided to have lunch? Us. One of the gnolls barked at him three times and then with a satisfied expression turned around and trotted back to his pack. Didn't like that, Artemal said. He's telling you to keep your distance, prevailed the smith said, riding over to the men. Stay alert. Sell Mr. tells us that today's a bad day. Yes, sir, Artemal nodded and watched as Reveal rode to the next post. I wish I had a personal mate to tell me when I was going to have a bad oh to have a bad day, said Patrick. Then you'd never get out of bed, Artemal grinned, and turned to survey the knolls as they passed. The sun shone and he squinted as he caught a glimpse of something unusual in the mist. Wait a minute, the captain murmured, and he waded into the center of the knolls. The confused band suddenly halted in its tracks. He pointed at one particular knoll in the center of the pack who had an elaborately crafted dagger in his belt. You, Artemal shouted. Since when do knolls carry daggers with the symbol of storm wind? Any knoll chief with his salt would have kept that for his personal spoils. Last. The knoll snapped in the human tongue. Immediately its form blurred into that of a human knight, and he launched the dagger into Artemal's throat with a frighteningly efficient motion. The sword came out of his sheath with blinding speed, and the knight hacked his way through the knoll band, shouting battle cries to Stormwind and the Holy Light. The knolls panicked and dispersed, leaving young Patrick to face the knight. That just goes to show why the Defius are such a cool... Um, opponent because the best antagonists have a system of morality and a justification for their actions that is plausible and perhaps even somewhat sympathetic even if it if it does ultimately sway in the side of evil which is why you can have flavor text here where the 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 point of view is that of the defius and it's and it's cool uh, originally, the Defius Brotherhood was a noble group and had an honorable goal. Stormwind's nobles had treated them poorly, and the Stonemasons had every right to resist. Now, however, times are different. A few older members may hold to their noble ideals, but clearly they can't be much involved in the Defius's dealings, or they would know better. The Defius Brotherhood is now a corrupt group, no better than any other gang of thugs. Current recruits are bandits and scoundrels. Three groups of followers exist in the Defius Brotherhood. First is the leadership. The original members, the artisans and laborers who were involved in the expulsion from Stormwind, many of these fit into the role of the embittered idealist. 
They still harbor a grudge against the cheating, corrupt nobility of Stormwind and are determined to force the nobles from power. They may be reasonable people on other matters, but no amount of time or persuasion can get them to change their minds about the noble houses or put aside their grievances. Like many strong-willed people who have experienced a wrong, hardened does not begin to describe their attitude. And that's all you can look at is some geopolitical conflicts around the world and see that same uh, conundrum. which explains, you know, why peace is so hard. The second group is the captains. Some serve as field commanders, while others are trained as tinkers and engineers. As they prove themselves, they advance through the ranks and, in time, are elevated to Van Cleef's inner circle. The third group is the rabble, mercenaries, brigands, and criminals, who gravitate to any cause where the money is good and brutality flows like cheap wine. They don't have much loyalty to the Defius Brotherhood beyond the nice feeling they get when the Brotherhood drops shiny silver coins into their palms. Mercenaries and soldiers do not rise into the captaincy or the inner circle without family connections. Here are their leaders. Well, there's of course Edmund Van Cleef, the male human, arguably the greatest architect in human history. Van Cleef is unfortunately also one of the most bitter and ruthless. He founded the Duffius Brotherhood as an instrument of revenge. His face is now wasted and hollow. He's no longer the noble figure he once was, but it's obviously corrupt. Basil Thread is another male human, the chief captain of the Duffius Brotherhood. Basil Thread's background is a mystery. This tall, broadly built human joined the Defius Brotherhood in his teens, and his intelligence and charisma shaped the Brotherhood's actions and inspired many of its infamous atrocities. Thread is a capable warrior, and his aggressive double-bladed fighting style is difficult to defeat. Thread is currently locked in the stockade of Stormwind City, but rules the prison like his own private kingdom. I was wondering why we hadn't encountered him yet. Marissa DePage is a female human. A Defius mage and a skilled transmuter, DePage is the daughter of one of Van Cleef's most skilled lieutenants, who was killed during the Stormwind City riot. Marissa, a golden-haired woman in her mid-twenties, always had an affinity toward both magic and cruelty, and the Defius Brotherhood gives her opportunities to indulge in both. She oversees operations in the upper levels of the dead mines and the training of magical adepts. Now, I can't remember ever seeing Marissa DePage, but obviously there's some explanation as to why there are so many mages in the dead mines. Gilnid, he, you fight him at the end of Deadbinds as a male goblin. In the crafting of technological automatons, Gilnid may have no equal. Amoral beyond the ability of the goblins to stomach, Gilnid was cast out of Booty Bay when his insane experiments ran amok in the city's marketplace. Gilnid had no interest in politics and plays no part in the Brotherhood's decision-making, but the Brotherhood funds its experiments and keeps him supplied with parts. Van Cleef has enormous, perhaps too much, respect for his mad talents. Okay, what if you wanted to be a hero within the Defius Brotherhood? Well, the Defius Brotherhood is an unlikely place to find heroes. The only people who join the Brotherhood these days are corrupt thugs, so hero is not exactly an appropriate term. Still, players could play corrupt Defius thugs. They rob from everyone and give to themselves, ambush merchant caravans, spy and scout for the Brotherhood, and engage in similar activity, activities related to an outlaw bandit gang operating in the wilderness. You could also play an older character um, that was part of the inner circle to where you maybe I could see making a campaign where you were at odds with the current, uh, means that the Defius employs, but you're working towards an end and, and are forced to make these morally gray, if not even darker, closer to black decisions. Um, or you're infiltrating from within all of them. Cool ideas. Here's the adventure hooks. When a teenage orphan goes berserk and stabs people at the inn in Stormwind City, the heroes link his behavior to a war orphanage. The orphanage is secretly run by the Deathiest Brotherhood to train new recruits who will eventually infiltrate the guards of Stormwind's noble houses. Stormwind's guards, not wishing to alarm the populace, ask the heroes to shut down the orphanage without killing the children. In the heart of Stormwind City is the Stockade, a great fortress prison. One of the people in the Stockade is Marty Branch, a condemned prisoner who knows a piece of information that might save the life of one of the hero's friends. Marty might know the whereabouts of an herb, which is an antidote to a rare poison, or he might have committed a crime for which his, the, the friend has been sentenced to hang. Unfortunately, the prisoners in the stockade have rioted and is under the control of the Defius Brotherhood. That's going to be cool to do that dungeon. The Knolls have turned against the Defius Brotherhood. Under the command of the Knoll chief Grimpaw, the Knolls attack the Brotherhood's encampments, killing their members and stealing their supplies. A desperate Defius Brotherhood captain, who was a friend of one of the heroes many years ago before the war, 
begs his friend to reinforce Defius' ranks. He reminds his adventuresome friend that he's human and of what gnolls do to human prisoners. Or Van Cleef is dead or dying, perhaps because some adventurers penetrated his stronghold and slew him. The Defius Brotherhood's leaders meet to determine his successor. The heroes, a known disreputable group, have been invited to the meeting. An emissary from the Church of the Holy Light comes to the heroes and urges them to betray the meeting to Stormwind, claiming that when Van Cleef dies, so will any virtue that's still attached to the Brotherhood's cause, if there was any. Um, yeah, I can't really, I'm not going to go on too much as before. I don't want any spoilers to, to get into the future, although I'm sure if you're listening, you probably already know. All right, so that's cool. We have another episode in the pipe, 5x5. Five five. As you can see, a little teaser down there. Our next chunk of chapters is going to probably be four or five long, and it's going to individually address each of the dragon flights as a faction. So I look forward to seeing everybody on those next episodes. Thank you so much for watching, for listening. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you on the next episode of Lore of Warcraft.